Hey, welcome to Screenplay Junkie. My name's Drew Helmick, and I love screenwriting and everything there is about movies. But before anything makes it to the screen, it always begins with text on paper. So if you're a fellow addict of film and storytelling, join my brothers, Matt and Brian, and I as we take a look at various types of screenplays, short stories, and other source material that were crucial to the creation of the stories we all love. There will be spoilers, though, so I do recommend being familiar with the title that's being discussed. Sound good? All right, then let's get started. Play Junkie episode number 42. Drew Van Bryan here. Jackie Robinson episode 42. Ooh, okay. All right. Oh, all right. Let's do it. Shout out, shout out. Hello. How are you guys doing today? Doing well. In this, all right. Uh, I mean, just all right. Pretty cold you know. Iowa City, eh? It's usually cold in November. Yeah. Good observation, Joel. Brian. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. What is this weather small talk? Forget this. So what do we got today? What do we got? Uh, we got rear window. Yeah, I was going to ask if any of you guys are like peeping Toms, you know, if you like to look out of your rear window sometimes, but... People watching is not... It, people watching is different from being a people uh, a peeping Tom, right? Because you can just look out a window and people watch, and it is interesting yeah. sometimes just to look what other people are doing. Peeping Tom, that's when you're like going up to someone's window, like watching them shower or like yes. watching them do something mm-hmm. a little think, bit more you strange. you considered a peeping Tom once you have like a facial expression of interest and... You're like looking sure. at something yeah. that I feel like you also have to have a mustache and like a trench coat, <laughs> and then you're a peeping tom. Just some prerequisite wardrobe. Yeah, I get what you're saying, but yeah, rear window. 1954. 1954. Believe it or not, off, off this title, like I kind of felt like I had like a speech impediment when trying to like say it. Like I would, I honestly would be like we a window when I would like say it aloud for some reason. <laughs> I couldn't get the rear window. I'd have to really have to think about it. All right, all right, interesting. You really got to enunciate it, yeah. yeah. I really got to enunciate it, yes. But, uh, yeah, uh, I bet uh, there's a probably other listeners out there who are f- more familiar with a movie that is like Rear Window that came out in 2007. With Shia LaBeouf. Yes. Shia, Shia LaBeouf. Stanley LaBeouf. LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf. Shia LaBeouf. What's the name of that movie? It's called Disturbia. The one we're talking about, yeah. It's... Like Rihanna, like this. Oh, yeah. Nice. I wasn't even thinking of that at all. That's a good song. Now I want to listen to it. Now I want to listen that to that. That is a really band. good song. But yeah, it's just Shia LaBeouf. He uh, goes under house arrest for something, and he just peeping Tom through his window. Yeah, and he suspects that his neighbor is committing murders, and that's exactly the plot of Rear Window, essentially. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So it ended up happening, too, because you know in 2007, when Disturbia came out, you know, anyone who knows movies can see that plot and say, wow, this is a total ripoff of Rear Window. Yes. So it went to court. And what ended up happening is that Disturbia won. They did not have to pay any royalties to Rear Window or the original writer of the short story that we all read. And it was because a judge ruled that the short story and the movie Rear Window were just two different of plots from Disturbia, which if you really watch both movies, they're, they're very pretty similar. much the same. Yeah. yeah, They're pretty much the same. <laughs> That's pushing the envelope right there as far as uh, regurgitating stories we've already seen before. Yeah, because your main character is confined to one area. He yes. can't leave that house. Yeah. And all he can do is watch his neighbors, watch everyone around him. But anyways, I, I like how you said, because uh, Rear Window, if you didn't know, is actually based off a short story. And it's called It Must Be Murder. You see, that's what I what I found really interesting because I thought it was a total Alf, Alfred Hitchcock idea, but just yeah. for him to take it and direct it, you know, it's something I just was unaware of. Yeah, man. I mean, and and this is actually the second episode that we've done with uh, when a short story has been made into a feature film, and there's a lot of other examples out there that exist. Yeah, exactly. I mean. We have a few written down here for you. I know I Am Legend is one. I read that short story, and it is much, much different from the movie. Um, In the short story, they're like vampires, and they can talk. And in the movie, they're just like zombies that are crazy and really fast, too. Uh, But other short stories that have been made into movies, we've got Brokeback Mountain, The Shawshank Redemption, Stand By Me, Memento, which is a great film, Christopher Nolan, 310 to Yuma, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, 
That's a short story. Have you guys ever seen that movie? I've never seen it. I've never seen that. I haven't was seen born it either. an old man and he died a baby. That's yeah. all I know. Um, next up, we got Arrival. That was a short story. Awesome movie. Everything Must Go. That's a Will Ferrell movie. It's a drama. If you haven't seen that, I've never heard of it. It's, I haven't. I've it, never heard of it. It's my favorite Will Ferrell uh, like role he's ever done. It's a total drama. It's it's not funny. I mean, yeah, you cringe while watching it because he's a brutal alcoholic and he's like throwing his life away. It's it's a really good, really really mm. good movie. I like it. Um, other short stories that have been made into movies. We got Total Recall. I've read that one. Yeah, Minority uh, Report. No. Total Recall and that? yeah, Total Recall and Minority Report are actually Sci-fi. by this by the same author, Philip oh, really? K. Dick. Yeah, oh, good uh, last name. Say. say that one more time, Philip K. Dick. Dick. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got The Fly. That was originally a short story that was published in Playboy in 1957. Ooh. If you've seen oh, that, Jeff, wow. that's a Jeff Goldblum movie from the 80s, and it's kind of, it's I, so I weird. Have that copy of it is Playboy. such a weird movie. Um, and then the last one I want to plug is Children of the Corn. That was a Stephen King short story. And uh, we actually did an episode on that on the show here back, episode eight. So if you want to hear yeah, that one, you, one, you can go all it. the way back. Man, we must have done that episode, what, like six months ago? No, more than that. More than that. Wow. Yeah, more Time than flies. that. I'd say, prob- I would say <laughs> probably like ten months ago. It's crazy. Ten or eleven. And lots of these short stories, too, that are published in magazines, which yeah. you know, have been completely eradicated by the Internet. Basically, you yeah. just don't see a lot of magazines being published anymore. No, and not if they paper, are, yeah. they're coming out monthly. And when you think of something like sports too, like ESPN the magazine, when that issue comes out, everything that's in there is irrelevant because you already know that it's already happened because of Twitter, yeah. because of your phone, because yep. of the news. Magazines, you know, they're pretty much irrelevant at this point. It's kind of sad, man, but that's just, just how it goes. Yeah, it's the way it goes. Well, I mean, do we want to talk about the IMDb info for Rear Window? Yeah, let's get into it. We already mentioned that the movie came out in 1954. And this is pretty crazy, okay? Now, a meta score on the mo- on the movie website we like to use, it's called the IMDb website, International Movie Database. Um, was that what it's called, actually? Am I wrong? Uh, actually the Internet Movie Database. Internet, yeah. I was like, international. It doesn't sound right. So it's the <laughs> Internet Movie Database, okay? In, in a meta score on this website, this is only from critics. This has nothing to do with a normal population. This is only the people who really, really know movies, right? And it they up, know the movies. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. They're so smart. Well, they gave it 100 yeah, out of 100. 100 out of 100. A perfect score. Yeah. Okay. And then wow. the people, the people, they gave it an 8.4 out of 10. So this is a really, yeah. really high regarded movie. Yeah. It's on many, many top critics lists for like top 100 movies you must see. I mean, this is something I would urge most people to watch. Well, because I mean, it's a classic, you know. It is. It's, it's one of a kind. It's definitely the first movie that like did something like this. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, for I mean, for at least Drew, we talked about it. We touched. I mean, this is one of those movies that you learn at school or any like film class that let's say that you would take. It's one of those where yeah. it's like when you look back at like the history and you bring up like uh, Alfred Hitchcock and uh, what Stanley I Kubrick. The other dude's name. I forgot the other dude's name. Stanley Kubrick. Um, no, Charlie Chaplin. Um, real old dude. I forgot his name. We can, but Charlie Chaplin. Yes, exactly. Thank you. You only had to say like it like twice. History films that you just <laughs> learned from like the start and how the film was like introduced. It's crazy how movies started out with no sound, right? Or they were all uh, yeah. Yeah. talking, right? Yeah. Um, but I'll go ahead and read the log line now for Rear Window. A wheelchair-bound photographer spies on his neighbors from his apartment window and becomes convinced one of them has committed murder. <laughs> Wait, are we watching Disturbia? <laughs> Yeah, the logline... Dude, I wonder what the logline for Disturbia is. I bet it's really similar, but I don't want to look it up. I mean, the premise for this movie is amazing. It is really cool. It's awesome. It's 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 so unique. He's confined to one space. He can't leave. Yes. So all he has to do is... All he, like, is able to do is just look out his window. Yeah, and just call the shots from his wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, such a time-fitting movie as well, because, like, I guess if you were to date it now, like, oh, just go play video games, watch TV, go play on your phone. No, you got nothing really to do. Yeah, man, seriously. You know what I mean? Right, and the guy said, too, the character, at least in the movie, he didn't like reading books. Yeah. So, I mean, what what the hell do you do in 1950 if you're not a reader? (laughs) I don't know. I got no idea. Uh, But this movie was directed by Alfred Hitchcock, legend. Legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And the screenplay was written by John Michael Hayes, and the original short story was written by Cornell Woolrich. Starring in this movie is James Stewart, Grace Kelly, Wendell Corey, Thelma Ritter, and Raymond Burr, all who, unfortunately, are deceased. Yeah. R.I.P. 
I mean, you could have guessed that though. This Makes came out sense. in 19 for just time, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's. that's I mean, nice. freaking Alfred Hitchcock. I'm pretty sure was born in like the 1800s. So good luck. Wow. It's just like, yeah, it's unbelievable. R.I.P. Well, right, so. well, I mean, I'm going back to this. We'll be at that point though, because we were born at the end of the night. Well, at the end of the ninth of uh, the 20th century. Yeah. So we're we'll, when we die, we'll be the 21st century. So when people look back, they'll be like, "Whoa, they were born in the nine like 1990s. That's Whoa. that's crazy. So kind of similar." All right, so let's talk. Uh, let's talk money. Um, all these numbers I'm about to give you, they they factor inflation. Okay, so this is not what they spent back in the day. This is what they spent if it was modernized with today's like you know dollar value. Yeah. Uh, the movie cost a million bucks in today's money. A million oh, bucks. That's, that's awesome. And worldwide, it made thirty seven million. So that's really really good. Yeah. And uh, all right, let's let's hop over to the trivia. Oh. So this film. Uh, is based, obviously, on the short story that was written and published in that magazine. Um, but it's also based on two real-life murders. And this is where Hitchcock came in and put his, you know, his point of view into it, okay? So these two real-life murders are, one, the 1910 case of Dr. Hawley Crippen and the 1924 case of Patrick Mohan, okay? This guy, Dr. Crippen, he killed his wife, told his friends that she went to America because he lived in England, and then he aroused suspicion after she had, you know, fled to America by flaunting his secretary around town while she was wearing his wife's jewelry. Good idea. So the police wow. later found body parts in the Crippen home of his wife, and they arrested the doctor for murder, okay? So he went down. The other case, <laughs> this guy, Mohan, okay, this guy dismembered his pregnant mistress, throwing oh. pieces of her body out a train window. What? All right, all right. But he didn't wow. know. Oh, oh, oh wait. The Polar Express? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> I'm not done yet, man. He didn't know what to do with her head, apparently. And this is a gruesome detail where Hitchcock, like, this is what inspired him to have the whole situation in the movie where, you know, your bad guy in the movie buries something in his garden, right? Yeah. And you don't know what it is. And apparently he digs it up and then puts it in his apartment later. I think it is supposed to be his wife's head. In probably, the film. Wow. probably, yeah. 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 Gross. It just goes to show how you can take some real life uh, horrible, horrible stories and uh, turn it into throw it in there, turn it into a film. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Brian, you brought this up off air. This entire movie was shot on a set, an indoor set, and this required months of planning and construction. And in today's money, it cost them about seven hundred, or excuse me, yes, yeah, seven hundred and thirty grand, seven hundred thirty thousand oh, dollars wow. to build that set. Oh. Okay. And it's it's all indoors. And to accommodate, in, oh, okay, wow. to accommodate this all enormous indoor set, a higher ceiling was required, required right? Because yes. these buildings were pretty tall. Yeah. Wow. So Hitchcock had the production company tear out the entire floor of the studio, basically the basement, revealing the basement, right? So they, they basically took a whole 15 feet out of the bottom of the studio and just made it more spacious, which is crazy. That's unbelievable. I mean, they had me fooled for sure. I mean, you, I mean, you can tell it's a set, but it's it, impressive. Lo- it looks like you're outside. It's incredibly yeah, impressive. Yeah, totally when you, when it comes to like production and like set design, whoever that team was, they absolutely did an amazing job. Yeah, they killed it. I mean, listen Seriously. to this. 1,000 arc lights were used to simulate sunlight. 1,000 lights. <laughs> and to be honest, dude, I didn't even question that. If it, I thought it was sunlight. And what like they I did, too. I wasn't sitting there, like, questioning lighting at all. That's this is how they fooled you. They had lights set up in different spaces all over the set so they could yeah. imitate different times of day. Okay? It's wow. really, really cool. Um, and while shooting this film, okay, Alfred Hitchcock only worked in the main character Jeff's apartment. So he would stay in there with him so he was from that point of view, right? Oh, The point of view idea. of the viewer, the point of view of the main character. Exactly, yeah. And the actors and actresses in other apartments... They wore flesh-colored earpieces so that he could radio into them what he wanted them to do. Ooh. And what he did, wow. too, was he would give them conflicting, like, uh, conflicting actions, right? He would give them conflicting things to do, and this would create tension and just create, like, natural humor. So, like, you know that one family that slept outside? Yeah. When yeah, they were yeah. supposed to bring their mattress in, the guy topples over. It's because he was telling the woman to pull left and him to pull left as well or whatever. So, like, <laughs> they were opposing each other, and it caused him to fall over. Got you. Right? That's awesome. I love it. So he was basically just like messing with his entire crew. Yeah. That's directing right there, Mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen. Live action, like reactions, you know? That's part of the best acting. Uh, They shot it for a month, only a month. And during that month long shoot, the actors who were the main characters, right? They were in their fake apartments. All those people you saw that never really had close ups or like, you couldn't really hear them speak like super loud and stuff. 
when it wasn't their time to be on camera, they just hung out in the apartment because it all had most of them had running water, toilets, so mm. they could just chill there like it was their actual home. Jesus. Wow. Pretty crazy. That is that's ridiculous that detail. That's awesome, yeah. Wow. I mean, it just goes to show how much effort they put into the set. Like, and what yeah. happens afterwards? They just tore it down. <laughs> yeah. You just oh, okay. I was wondering that movie's too. over. Let's just tear it all down. It's not like it's not like a like in a set because I know for like Hitchcock's Psycho, I think it's like a attraction now. You can like go to the yeah the, the, the mansion. Yeah, the mansion is an attraction. That's correct. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, that's so, a good question. So, I wonder what they did with that set, right? I don't mm-hmm. know, man. We'll have to find it out later. Let's talk about the leading woman in this movie, Grace Kelly, the beautiful Grace Kelly. This is the only movie in which she is seen smoking a cigarette. She actually okay. refused to smoke on screen in all of her other movies, which for this time seems kind of strange yeah, because yeah, back yeah, in yeah. the 50s, everybody smoked. I mean, you could smoke Correct. at work. You could smoke on an airplane for yeah, Christ's sake. In a hospital, didn't matter. Times really have changed. Yeah. Now, now you got people jeweling. <laughs> Vape God. <laughs> All right, so I got two more things, right? The first is that Alfred Hitchcock purposely made the bad guy in this movie look just like a Hollywood executive producer that he hated. Oh, really? <laughs> he despised this guy, so he made this bad guy in the movie look just like him. And if you took a side-by-side of them, according to it the actors similar. on set, oh, it was identical. <laughs> wow. so, so this producer definitely knew like when this movie came out that Hitchcock was taking a shot at him big time. Dude, damn. And the last thing I have is that Oh, wait, we already talked about it. Disturbia, total ripoff, and somehow yeah, they got yeah, away yeah. with the lawsuit. I don't know how. I have no idea. No. The, the movie is literally the exact same. Yeah, it, it's, it's a carbon <laughs> just a, copy. Just an updated version. Yes. All right, cool. That wraps up what I got. Let's talk about the short story. It's called It Had to Be Murder, and it was written by Cornell Woolrich. It was originally published in Dime Detective, which was a pulp magazine that featured, and you guessed it, mystery and detective fiction in February of 1942. So this is during World War II, people. Entertainment. This is, okay. this is the okay. peak of entertainment during World War II. Like, what else were you going to do other yeah. than read these things? Ah, oh, I should have checked how old this guy was because it's like, this guy's writing stories. He must have been older because it's like, well, why, why aren't you fighting in the war? Mm-hmm. You he know? must have been older. Yeah, okay. True, true. But uh, yeah, let's just run through the main plot points here, guys, because um, there, there are some differences. Mainly, it's pretty similar, but... There are some things that are quite different, so I want to discuss them. So let, let's just let's just dive right into this. So, main character is Hal Jeffries, and he does have a broken leg, but you really don't find that out until like specifically until the end. So it's kind of like a mystery, you know, what's wrong with this guy? You just know that he's immobilized. He can only stay in his bedroom essentially. Yeah, in his apartment. Yeah, he mentions that he has to like hop around or something. But literally, mm-hmm. I mean, call me crazy but we do we even find out how he even happens to him nope i don't think so only no. in the movie do well, they go into so. that specification yeah. yeah in the short story they give you no details of how he hurt himself yeah no okay and it's told from the first person so it's just like you're reading <clears throat> it's like you're reading a diary like if someone were to write it from their point of view essentially um and then we have another character his name is sam and he is his day houseman who helps him uh and it's basically the same thing in the film jeffries is observing people which in the movie, I really like because he's observing these characters and we never have these interactions with them, but I feel like you get to learn so much about them just from watching what they do, mm-hmm. which is kind of cool, you know? Um, so Thorwald specifically, we see that he's treating his ill wife, uh, but one main difference in the short story is that Jeffries does not look through a camera lens or through binoculars. Yeah, which in the movie is huge because that... That heightens your vision. It allows you to see things more clearly. Yeah, exactly. So it makes a ton of sense that you would have that. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're you know, confined to one space and all you're doing is people watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's fast forward to a part when Jeffries is observing his neighbors at night and there's like a scream. Is there like a scream mentioned in the... Or no, there wasn't. There wasn't a scream because in the movie there is a scream that you hear like somebody yeah. dying or something. But uh, all you hear is one cricket making its noise and that's when uh sam the house man mentions that what does he say exactly I mean, like we're talking house man I, I feel like i have to mention like this is a black guy yeah it is who's like <laughs> basically the butler for this white main character and i want to mention too like this story was written in nine four, 1942 and there are some overtly racist yeah there were that there were, were yeah totally were ridiculous but yep. it was 1942 and i guess it was okay at that time which clearly is ridiculous right now but yes but that's, that's who this he, character is. He says it's a sign of death someplace close around for the, uh, the cricket. 
Yeah, that's what he, he says. If you only hear one cricket instead of like a pack of crickets, if even if that's even what they're called, a pack of crickets. But uh, when you hear one cricket, it means that it's a sign of death someplace close around. Which is this even a saying, guys? Like I, I, I tried to look it up and I never couldn't find it anything. Before. Never heard of it. But that is I've an, never heard of it either. That is an interesting like thing to think about, I guess. But um, so some time passes by, and Jeff Jeffries notices that Thorwald's wife is gone. She's been removed from her bed or what have you, uh, and that Thorwald has stopped tending to her. So he decides to call Boyne, who is uh, his detective friend. Yeah, instant red flag. I mean, the guy is looking suspicious. He's moving around his apartment, and his wife's not there anymore. Really suspicious. Wasn't his wife, like, down, like, sick, too? That's why she was in bed all day? Like, she wouldn't just be able to get up and go? Yeah, the word they use in the film is she was an invalid, right? Mm -hmm. Um, She needed caretaking at all times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Well... Jeffries is able to supply at least some sort of like probable cause, but not really because the police eventually break into Thorwald's uh, apartment. Completely and search illegal. It. Yeah, Completely exactly. Completely right. illegal. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't find anything, so there is no evidence in there. So Jeffries decides to write a letter to Thorwald that says, What have you done with her on it? Yeah, he's trying to stir the pot. Yeah, so he says Sam over there to uh, put the note underneath his door. And when he watches Thorwald open the letter, he can see on just from his facial expression that he's guilty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the next thing that Jeffries does is he calls Thorwald and he's able to lure him out of his apartment by telling him that he knows what he did and that he must meet him somewhere, which they don't say where, but that he must listen to this, that he must pay a sum of $70 to keep to keep him quiet. Yeah, Which what, seventy dollars in nineteen forty two? I don't know to to cover up a murder. Oh yeah, what a <laughs> what a great bribe! Excellent, seventy bucks. That's, that's it. That today, that's like a video game and like uh, yeah, totally. You know. It's not even a nice <laughs> dinner. It's nothing. <laughs> but uh, but of course, our our main character Jeffries does not leave the house. It's just a ploy to get him out, right? Because he's got a broken leg. Yeah, and then uh. So while Thorwald is out, he has I think they said he, he has like 20 minutes or something. Mm-hmm. So Jeffrey sends Sam over to Thorwald's to look around. Um, but this is kind of the part where the short story got kind of confusing. Uh, maybe yeah. it was just the writing style or, I don't know, just the chain of events got kind of weird for me. Because Thorwald somehow is able to call Jeff back and he just tests his voice. And he somehow finds out where he lives. See, this is how he did it, though. It wasn't explained. And it was better explained in the movie because they have phone books. So once he realized, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. this person has to be in this complex, like he just got in the phone book, looked up the registries of where these people live, and he probably just made a few calls. Oh, and just then, to test the voice, yeah. And then when he realized, okay, this person seems scared on the other line, that's my person that I, that's that been spying on me. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't know. kind of seems like a long shot, but it's okay. Uh, Thorwald breaks into Jeffrey's place and tries to kill him, and he has a pistol with him, and he shoots twice and misses. Horrible aim. And this is like when Boyne, the, the detective friend, shows up I don't like, know at where. the same time, basically. Makes no sense. And uh, so Thorwald jumps out of Jeffrey's window and then scales his own building <laughs> to go to his room, but he falls to his death Spider-Man. on accident. Oh, until the end. Yeah. Splat. Yeah, and then so this is when the cops actually believe Jeffries. Uh, they investigate what he's been talking about, and they find Thorwald's buried wife uh, in, like, a room above his that was under construction. Yep, he put her under cement. Pretty messed up, definitely. Yes. He put her under cement, yeah. It's yeah. A, uh, an odorless grave. <laughs> That's what it said in the short story. Oh, it did? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but, okay, let's, let's just round this up, because it, it just into the motivation of Thorwald, because... It gets kind of unclear as to why this is all happening. So this is why Thorwald did it. He was running out of money, and he did not work. He was tired of caring for his wife, and he had her insured and was slowly poisoning her, but she caught on. So he murdered her. Strangled her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And he was also having an affair with another woman who posed as Mrs. Thorwald in the country because that's where he told the authorities where she went to get better out in the country somewhere and um their goal was yeah so their goal was to fake mrs thorwald's death and collect insurance money basically is what they're trying to do that's a scheme that's been done before man that's i feel like other movies have tried to do this shit or in real life people have tried this before yeah you don't get away with it no you never do no way 
So what, like really quickly, what are your thoughts on the short story? I mean, the meat and bones of it are great. It's just like reading something from 1942. It was kind of hard to follow at points. <laughs> I mean, the language, <laughs> it, it was from this guy's point of view too. And yeah, the language, like he, he like would overly describe some things then give such little description for other things. It was just kind of strange and, and hard to follow at points. Yeah. But like I said, the meat and bones of it, they're great. Like it's a guy confined to one space looking out his window. And then he's like, wait, like, I think I just figured out someone got murdered. Mm. I mean, crazy. I've second all of that. I mean, the only issue I ever had when reading this, when looking at it, eight, by, eight and a half by 11, there's text corner to corner. It was tough to get through. <laughs> oh yeah, it was. Um, yeah. Got through it. But yeah, I hundred percent appreciate the story. And especially at the beginning, like describing each apartment room, like it's just, everybody had their own personality and like lifestyle. So, yeah, and he's I just sitting it. there looking in on their lives without them yeah. knowing. I'm I'm sure if you read this in 1942, it was probably awesome, like when it came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to comment was just on his, the guy's writing style. There were a couple parts, a couple parts that I was like, "Ooh, nice!" Like he had a couple like really awesome metaphors and similes. Like uh, one of them was like I can't remember what he was describing, but he he described it as being tighter than a straight jacket, and I was just like, "Oh, that's awesome!" Like you know. Good description. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So cool premise. But let's talk about the film, huh? The film basically took um, the character Sam, right? His assistant in the short story. And yeah. turned him into uh, the girlfriend. Lisa, yeah. The girlfriend of the man. And then they also threw in a nurse that was helping him out while he had his broken Stella, leg. Stella, okay. I believe, was her name. Yes. They added, they added yes. two extra characters there. Um, but other than that, the premise is basically the same. They just yes. added more. Because the short story we read, I know it was single-spaced. It was about 13 pages. So I would guess in the magazine it would be about the same 15, maybe, yeah, 20, maybe pages, a little more, yeah. 20 pages max. <laughs> yeah. And they turned this into an hour and 52-minute film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, they packed in uh, some relationship stuff. One of the main themes in the movie is uh, marriage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because our main character is struggling with going into marriage if yeah. he wants to I, commit I to it. I have a problem, honestly, how this movie, genre-wise, is classified as a thriller mystery. Like, why is it not a romance as well? Because it's clearly a romance. It is, yeah, I, I could agree with All that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of romance, I want to pick up in the first kind of opening shots of this film, right? You get to see this awesome set they built, like what we talked about, 700 something thousand dollars to build it. Yeah. And the camera's panning around, and we, we zoom in on one couple, and apparently it's really, really hot out. Whatever city they're living in, they never specify. Probably New York. That would be my yeah, guess. Yeah. Probably. And this couple is on their balcony of their apartment with a mattress, and they're sleeping outside because it's <laughs> too hot to yeah. sleep in their apartment. And I, I just don't get what they were doing. Everyone else in the neighborhood was sleeping inside. And if it's the middle of the summer and it's hot, there's got to be so many mosquitoes and bugs. <laughs> oh, man, sleeping outside without a tent would be miserable. Well, nobody had screens. <laughs> That's true, too. For their windows. No one even had screens on their it's windows. because it was indoors, but whatever. I mean, we can even talk safety hazards here. They're on, the, they're on a fire escape. They can roll off. and <laughs> There's a lot of there's a lot of issues with this. <laughs> well, remember, at one point, too, it started raining on them, so they had to throw yeah. their mattress inside, and the guy was toppling over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that scene where Hitchcock was in their ear telling one guy to go left and the other woman to go right, and then they fell over. <laughs> <laughs> But every every neighbor uh, that Jeffries is watching while he's in his wheelchair, they they all seem to have some sort of connection to uh, like marital problems or aspirations mm-hmm. or just getting married. Mar- marriage is a very central theme in this. Do you, somebody want to mention the cast right quick? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's just funny watching a guy you know struggle in a cast. I mean, I could just put myself. I, have you guys ever been in a cast? First of all, no. no I've been in a a sling, which you can get in there and you can scratch though. When you got yes. a cast. You can't scratch your knee, full leg cast. You can't get in there at all. And no. that must be totally miserable for eight weeks. Oh, that would you be can't awful. scratch your knee. You can't scratch your leg. No, it's all, no thank you. Scratching, it smells. You can't wash it. And... Yeah. Oh my gosh, that'd be horrible. Like it, anytime, you, anytime you get an itch, you just have to like think it away. You just have to like not think about it. Yeah. That would suck. Dude, I, I my initial thought was like, what if a spider goes down there? What do you do? What do you do? <laughs> I don't know, man. You just, you just I just hope it dies. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but let's talk about our main characters, Jeffries and Lisa, and their relationship, guys. Just to hit this off. Because... Well, right off the bat, their age difference is just so incredibly obvious. Like, <laughs> he's like 50 years His old, hair and she's like graying. 20. Yeah. And she's beautiful, by the way. But I, you're right about that. 
But I, I uh, there's a comment here that says most movies from this time period did this, which is absolutely correct. Yeah, I mean, this was actually a point our dad brought up because he walked down when I was watching the movie earlier today when you were at work, Drew. And he's like, I was complaining to him. I'm like, why would this girl like want anything to do with this old man? Like, what is going on? He's like, that's every movie. Like, Humphrey Bogart, he brought up him. He's like, he was 60 in some movies, like, dating a 20-year-old. That's just, that's just <laughs> what they did. For some reason, those leading men, they just kept holding on to roles, and they just kept rotating young women to be, like, the leading female with them. I got, I got a question. Wow. Haley, would you date a 60-year-old man? Yeah. That was a soft yes. I don't know if we heard you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. Does he have money? Oh, wow. That, that's what you're a gold digger? Sugar daddy? That, that was the angle, though. I guess it is the angle. I don't know. Although in this movie, it seemed like the girl had money. Like, she was, yeah, she she was, was well off. She showed up, and the first time we see her, she's in this gorgeous dress. She brings him this lavish five-star dinner. Yeah. And before that, too, Correct. all he's doing is just complaining to his nurse about how, oh, she's too good for me. She's too perfect. I don't want to marry her. And I just wanted to go inside the movie and smack him across his face. <laughs> well, here's the thing, because you're totally right, but... This woman threatens his masculinity. Like, during this time frame, like, I, you know, you can go, we can do a whole podcast on gender roles, but, like, this time I, I frame specifically, like, yeah. men were like, Whoa, we superior. are men. No, yeah. they, they were superior, absolutely. Yeah. That, Especially in the know. film industry, man. I mean, that's, that, like, that hierarchy didn't even come out until, like, years ago with the whole Me Too stuff, right? Where they're finally getting to this point that we should have been at years ago. But, yeah, I, I don't know what his deal was. He He wanted to, like, end things with her. And then she shows up, and she's just like every man's dream girl. Yeah, totally. <laughs> well, because she's she's a um, a strong, independent woman, and I mean, he's just oh, yeah. he's afraid of her, man. Uh, I mean, plus, just as far as the movie is concerned, when you actually get into the mystery thriller type part of it, like he literally cannot do anything because he's bound to yeah. a wheelchair. Like she has to do everything, which she's down. She to do. she is the one who is courageous in going out there and doing everything because he can't. She's almost like too courageous at times. Yeah, man, that that would be terrifying to, you know. But I, I know Matt, you had you made this comment that you're saying finally with 38 minutes uh, oh, into pa- the movie. I paused the movie. I paused it and I was like, Jesus, how long have I been watching this? <laughs> because it takes 38 minutes, 38 minutes before the main character has any insinuation that one of his neighbors could be a murderer. It yeah. takes one third of the movie. For that to happen because I mean, they're, they're setting the scene you know they're showing the appreciation of the 700,000 they spent on the set yeah but there's they're also setting up the romantic aspect of it which is why I said earlier this movie should have been listed as a romantic like part of that in the, in the okay. genre it should have been in the genre it's it's a romance yeah I mean I'm gonna I'm gonna have to say this again I mean the love story in this movie it's incredibly and galactically boring I, I don't care about it I don't care about it at all because <laughs> this guy all he has to do is just accept this woman because she's amazing she's she, he should marry her like Everyone in his life should be screaming at him to marry this Gold woman. Star. And I was exactly. just so I was just so fed up with their love story. I mean, they were like bickering and things. It's just like, what are you doing? This girl's amazing. That's just the story. Hey, it's just the marriage theme they were pushing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and and his, uh, you know, he he felt threatened by his masculinity, as we said earlier. Yeah, yeah I guess there's <laughs> even like an idea. To- oh like, wait, toxic masculinity. Movies, like, well, that and like, I guess like the movies like based like I guess looking at other things, but. I, if they wanted to bring more story, like to the inside of his own room, you know, that's what they brought into that situation with marriage. But it's probably definitely with marriage. But rather than to try to like only focusing on like looking through people's windows, you know what I mean? No, I think he's just trying to say. Are you trying to say like the other people that he's watching are like going through different like yeah, marital? Like, if, if they didn't include the marriage thing and the girl, like it would only just be him looking out the window. Uh, I get what you're saying, yeah. So, yeah, the, right. so that the conflict, the first conflict is him, is him not wanting to get married, and then the yeah. larger conflict is the uh, the killing of an of a spouse, the neighbor and his wife. Mm-hmm. So, and that's what brings them together. That's what makes them realize that they need to get married, guys. <laughs> I I guess you just have to go through those life and death situations to be married. Um, something I want to bring up right away here is just like. Again, we, we established that this, this man, our leading man, is, is about 50. You know, he's older, and the leading woman is much younger than him, about half his age, right? Yeah. And so many times throughout this movie, uh, as he's people watching, there's a ballerina that lives across the street from him. Yeah, yeah. And they show this girl, must like it must be like five or ten times, and then they just show the guy just like gawking at just her. Just drooling like, over drooling her. Drooling over yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, And I was just like, man, how many times do I have to watch this old guy look at well, this 20-year-old? I mean, there, there's like different stages of like this whole rear window aspect. It's him, you know, 
trying to figure out a murder, and then you can go complete opposite, where he's just being a straight up peeping top. Yeah, and enjoying it. Yes. Oh, I also want to mention too, like everyone is always drinking in this movie. Like, oh yeah, everybody. it's like, the fifties smoking. Who, care, who cares what time of day it is? I love how too uh, in, in the opening scenes, his girlfriend comes by and she mentions like, "Hey, yeah, this was my day." You know, for lunch, I had to go out for lunch and have drinks. Then I had to go have drinks here, and now I'm here having Oh, yeah, you, that shit was hilarious. And I'm having drinks. I'm like, geez, this girl's, like, blacked out. <laughs> she's, having a, she's having a bender. This girl's on a big-time bender. I was thinking about that, too. I was like, oh, my God. Like, this and is your normal work day? All hard liquor, too. Yeah, seriously. No, no, no light beer out there. No light beer, people. Crazy. Uh, I know you. this is another critique of yours, Matt, the 90-minute mark. So at 90 minutes in, well, I said 38 minutes in. That's when he finds finally yeah, right. suspects or is suspicious that his neighbor could be a murderer. So 90 minutes in, I'm talking an hour and a half into this movie, that's when they finally decide to, like, provoke this guy. They write yeah. the letter saying, hey, we know what you did, and they slide it under his door. Finally, 90 minutes in. How much time's remaining? 22 minutes. <laughs> In this last 22 minutes is where all the bulk of the sus- sus- suspense, yeah. the thrilling moments, they all happen in this last 22 minutes. But you've gotten to know these characters so well for exactly. that time, man. And that's why, and, and when you're watching this movie back in the day, too, like, those scenes that I'm complaining about that were boring to yeah, me. Yeah, there that was, was important norm. to them, That man. was the norm. You yeah. Know, that was just the usual movie-going experience for them. And then right. I see it today, and I, I, you know, I'm you i bickering about it. But Well, because we're desensitized. We watch John Wick, where all he does is kill people yeah, the whole movie. Exactly. Action-packed. <laughs> yes. That's, that's, that's I actually what. watched John Wick 3 recently. Uh, <laughs> shout out that movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but another thing I want to mention, just at this 90-minute mark, like it's the first time there's any suspense, like I just said, and it's the first time you're really concerned that one of your main characters is, is like at risk of dying or being caught. Being, yes. in a, yep. being in a situation that's you know could be negative for them. Well, so we're talking about Lisa when she goes into Thorwald's apartment, exactly. Which that 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 that's awesome because you're you're seeing it from only Jeffrey's perspective, and mm-hmm. there's nothing you can do about it. How about the parkour she did? She did some serious parkour. Uh, she like scaled yeah, the fire escape and then jumped because the window was locked in the fire escape, but the other window to the right of it was open. Yeah. She literally could have fallen to her death. It was tight. She was smooth as hell doing that. I think that was the real girl, too. It looked just like her. It made her even better in a person She does her own stunts. That one. How can you not marry this girl? She does her own stunts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you commented on why isn't his door locked, right? Yeah. It, yeah. It's never locked well, throughout the film at all. It's yeah. but, he, yeah. but he physically can't lock it. Yeah, and he needs to have it open so like if Lisa and Stella come back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so exactly. there's no way. Um, so it, basically, the film ends with uh, Thorwald figuring out where Jeffries is located. Uh, well, he, he's able to find them because they're spying on him and they have a light on. So he visually can see them. Finally. Uh, so he comes over when Jeffries is alone because Lisa gets taken to jail. Uh, because when she's in Thorwald's place, they call the police. To save her life. To save her life, He would have yeah. killed her because she got caught snooping around in there. Yeah. So the police show up and they save her, but they take her to jail for breaking and entering, mm-hmm. essentially. But she also and had burg- evidence. Burglary. She had evidence proving that Thorwald was guilty because she had her, his wife's uh, wedding ring. Yeah. Which, why would a woman in 1954 go to all across the country without her wedding ring, right? It makes yeah. no sense. Yeah. Especially when marriage is such a central theme of this movie. Yes. Um so Thorwald breaks into Jeffrey's apartment and... We didn't really break in. The door's open. Oh, uh, yeah. He just walks in. But <laughs> uh, there's the whole scene where Jeffrey's, of course, he's because he's a photographer, he's doing the flashbulb thing to, like, stun him momentarily. Which would you know, probably like Thorwald throughout this whole time. Like, is just taking shot after shot and just close his eyes and eliminate all of the pain. And he just doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, he, he's walking real slow too. There, yeah. I, I was thinking of that moment. I was like, "This is like a video game when like you're the you're the small yeah. little guy and you're facing yeah, this true. giant boss, Dude, and you have to use this like gimmicky method." Me of, like, Frankenstein. He's like coming in, and it's like, don't they do that to him too? They like slash him, and he's like, "Oh, oh well, like, I think you're right." I'd say the way they put, they put fire in his face, and he doesn't like the fire. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I'd say just the way he re- reacts and like throws his hands up. It looks like yeah, Super it looks goofy. like a Frankenstein type thing. Super goofy. But Thorwald eventually gets hold of Jeffries. He's, like, trying to strangle him. Out and then, the window. And then he, like, tries to throw him out the window. Uh, but the cops get there. They bring Thorwald back. But Jeffries falls to the uh, ground below. Two and, stories. And breaks his other leg. So now he's got two broken legs. <laughs> Which, would, that sounds terrible. Now he's completely immobilized. Because in the beginning, he could, like, at least hop around on one leg. Yeah. I wonder, too, because um, in the way the plot worked, one week after where the story takes place, he was supposed to get his other cast off. 
So did he re-break the leg on his way down, also breaking his other leg? Probably. Yes. It'd be awful, most definitely. Yeah. At least he got the girl. Eight more weeks of in a cast. At least yeah, he realized right. that he should marry this, you know, perfect woman. Yeah, Jesus, right? Yeah, true. <laughs> okay, well, let's move into final thoughts, guys, if, you, if you're ready. What do you think? Yeah, I'm good. All right, so yeah, all right, my first question. Um, so which do you like more, the short story or the film? Uh, does I say the film? The film? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the yes, film, all absolutely. three. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just like looking from the point of view, like the certain shots I do where you can just people watch with – with the main character, you're yeah. there with him watching. It's it's really neat. I mean, you're getting insight on people's lives without even having them talking or yeah, yeah. or doing anything like, and they're completely unaware that you're watching. Totally. I mean, to me, the most powerful, um, you know, people watching he does is on the woman that's lonely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, her story is really interesting. Well, I mean, I mean, she's the complete opposite of him, basically. Yeah. yeah. Like in, in aspects, because he he's refusing marriage, and she, that's all she wants. Yep. All she wants yep. is to be with someone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the short story is still good, but the movie is definitely better. Um, it just has it's just more full. Even yeah. though I have my critiques where I thought it was too long, blah blah blah. Sure. The short story just lacked, you know, certain parts to really make it wholesome. So, so then, does the film hold up? To me, yes. Um, I'll, I'll say this too: they did an awesome job remastering it, so that makes it a lot easier to watch. Yeah, I, I think it's still great. Um, it, it's something where if you love movies. You're gonna really want to watch this. Like we said earlier, yeah, like totally. this, is, this is on every critic's top 100. This yeah. is a movie that is a piece of art. It really is. Yeah, it's yeah. a piece of art. I mean, you know, sure, it came out in 1954, which clearly it is dated, but I mean, it does hold up absolutely. I mean, like we said earlier, especially that, the end. The end more than anything, because the yeah. beginning is it's, it can be boring. But th- this is this is something that you watch. Like if you're gonna go into like a film class or any sort of like film, you know, analysis type class or anything. I mean, I watch this movie in my, um, my 20th century American lit class, you know, this is something that people study and yeah. watch because it's so amazing and appreciate. It. Yeah. Um, all right, well then let's just, let's just get your final thought. Your, your very final thoughts on the movie itself. Go ahead. I mean, did you, we've already said it. There's, Probably won't reiterate. It's, it's a good movie to watch, like you said. You learn about it in class. Well, it's and it's star rating. Yeah. If you're a film guy and want to learn, uh, check out Alfred Hitchcock. So, what's your star rating? Uh, I'm gonna go with four to five. You know, I just the camera work, especially, and like the whole set design and everything is what I appreciate the most about it, and even the story. But like Matt's been saying, the slowness you could have picked up a little bit at points. Yeah. Yeah. All right, right on. Drew, yeah, can you do me uh, a favor? Can you uh, um, define voyeurism? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have like the uh, the Webster definition. It's in my basically mind, just but like point just, of view, right? Yeah, just it's basically like saying point of view yeah. in the movie. Th- this is why I really like the movie. You only know what Jeff knows, the main character, or, or he's only yeah. he's Jeff in the story. What's his name in the movie? Jeffries. Oh. Jeffries. Yeah, right. Jeffries. You only know what he knows. It's told completely from his point of view, which is cool, right? And Hitchcock does that. In other of his movies, I think it's like Psycho, he does it in right? Psycho as yeah. well. It's from yeah. the point of view of the killer. Yeah. Um, but another like theme, or I guess you want to like that I want to bring up is just morality, right? Because obviously, what the killer did is immoral. He killed his wife. That's totally immoral. But yet, our main character <laughs> is also doing immoral things. He's spying on other people's lives. Like, yeah. That's not cool. But it, this is good spying. Uh, well, <laughs> in terms of the outcome, yeah, yeah what yeah, he yeah. did did help other people. But at the same time, like. He had no right to be looking on these other people's lives. No. Nah. And a big part of this is when, when you look at the end of the movie, when the killer walks into Jeffrey's apartment, he says, why are you doing this to me? What do you want? Oh, yeah, he can't even answer him. What do you want? And he can't answer because he knows what he did was wrong. Yeah. Because he was spying, right? It, it was immoral what he was doing. So, I mean, this, this was a big thing that I think Hitchcock was trying to do. Like, in that moment, he wanted you to feel for the killer, which I, I, did, I did not. But no. that's what Hitchcock did want to do. He, he wanted you to make... He wanted you to feel that the main character did do something wrong. Well, I definitely wanted him to answer. When Thorwald was asking him, and he had to ask him a second time, I wanted to know why, but yeah, he didn't. He's not going to answer. I just thought that was cool. I mean, I'll give this a star rating. I, I think it's a three out of five. Um, only because, you know, I would have gone four with you, Brian, but just because it's a little bit outdated, I'll go to three. You know, I can't recommend this to everybody. You have to really enjoy movies and appreciate Alfred Hitchcock, you know, the yeah. the, the creator of the thriller, essentially. In movies, um, I, I really like it. The short story did drag, or not necessarily drag, but it was just hard to follow. So definitely, the movie was better. Yeah, I agree. I like the movie more. Uh, four out of five stars. I do like the short story though. Um, 
So if you if you're really into reading short stories, check it out. The best part of the short story is when he sends uh, Sam, you know, his like butler essentially yeah. to go sneak in. I, I love yeah. that. Very uh, cool. But but as far as the film is concerned, like we already said, the voyeur the voyeuristic directing is pretty cool. Uh, and overall, the way it's shot, where it takes place, I mean, really where it takes place is just incredibly unique. Uh, I've never seen anything like it before, and just just how it looks. Um, I also love the character situation, uh, namely Jeffrey's, just the thought of being bound to a wheelchair and not being able to do anything and just watching is just, uh, I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah, just like Shia LaBeouf is under house arrest in Disturbia. Oh, wait, that sounds really, that yeah. sounds really similar. And then, of course, and then lastly, just Alfred Hitchcock, uh, Jimmy Stewart, and Grace Kelly. I think they all just did a fantastic job. I feel like we should have been calling him Sir Alfred Hitchcock this whole time. He is knighted. Really? Yeah, he's a sir. You think he has like a suit of armor? Totally. I, think, I feel like you have to if you're a sir. You gotta have a suit of armor. You're a knight. <laughs> Runescape. No matter what platform you're using to listen to us, I want it to be known that we're available on iTunes, YouTube, and Spreaker. You can also find us on Instagram at screenplay underscore junkie. If you like our content, please be sure to follow our channels so you can stay in the loop with new episodes and quick movie reviews. Feel free to give us a rating or drop us a comment on any of these mediums. Any feedback or interaction is greatly appreciated. Got any scripts you think we should read or movies we should review? Shoot us a message on our Instagram or email us at screenplayjunkie.show at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. On the next episode, we're going to hit the theater for a movie review on Ryan Johnson's latest mystery comedy, Knives Out. Thank you for listening. We hope you can join us next time.